get an initial velocity. You can be cruising along at a velocity, but can you tell? If you've got nothing else to reference, no other reference point, can you tell your movement if you're not accelerating? If you're accelerating, you'll feel what? A force, right? So that will tell you, oh, I'm moving. But um, I don't know if any of you have ever traveled in Europe or Japan, and, if, uh, and I don't know if China, Tingy, does China have bullet trains? Does China have bullet trains? Oh, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. Never been on. Um, but anyway, if you're, if you're on a bullet train, which is actually a, a magnetic levitated train, um, it's very, very smooth ride. If it's dark, if it's completely dark and you got the things pulled, you can barely tell you're moving because you don't feel any. But anytime you get jostled, well, what happens? You've changed direction there a little bit, so there's an acceleration. So you feel those forces. However, if you're just cruising along, cruising along, and you've got no other reference frame, you can't tell if you're moving or not. That's an inertial reference frame, okay? That's what an inertial reference frame is, all right? Now, and the laws of physics apply in all inertial reference frames, and they're all relative. In other words, one, one reference frame is no different than another. Who's to say, according to Einstein, if you're driving, if you're taking my daughter back to college, back when she's in college in, in the middle of Iowa there, um, and the cornfields are whipping by you as you're going up I-35 at 70 miles an hour, are you going 70 miles an hour north, or is the cornfield going 70 miles an hour south? Both are correct answers. Both are correct answers, okay? And, um, and so the velocity of the corn, relative to me, is 70 miles an hour south. The velocity of the car relative to the corn is 70 miles an hour north. The velocity is the same, okay? The velocity is the same in both situations. Now, if the corn is a station, if somebody's a stationary observer on the side of the road and watches me go by, whoosh, whose clock is going faster? Mine, according to the observer on the ground. Mine or his? His is going faster. His is beating faster. And my time is actually dilated. Okay? That's kind of one of those weird things. Okay? That's when they talk about if you go as fast as you can, if you get approach close to the speed of light and go on a trip and come back, you haven't aged according to the people here because your clock was going boing, 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 so slow. Your heart rate, every, anything that can be timed. All right? Now, we're very used to, in our world, that time can't stretch. Time can stretch. Time can stretch and contract. Okay? It just depends on the reference frame that you're in. So a second is not a second. All right? It is in our reference frame right here, but we've got time. That, so we set up a general thing that that's why, that's why the whole meter thing is based on... Um, Atomic clock, the second is, is based on how many oscillations a cesium atom does in a second or something like that. And, and, it, and it's like more than five, but I can't remember how many. It's a huge number. All right. And that gives us a second. And the meter is how far um, light travels within that amount of time that, that of those certain os oscillations on the cesium clock that gives us a second. Okay. That's, that's what, a, what a meter is. Okay, so, in other words, in one tick, in one oscillation of that cesium atom, speed of light going that in, within that one tick, that's what gives us a meter here on Earth. And we measure things here on Earth. Whenever you measure things that's stationary, that's its real length. So you gotta get some, here, let me get some ideas down before I show you these little things, and then pretty much kind of let you... Um, go, but I, oh, I've also got a few homework problems I'd like to do. But did I bring in? I'm about to bring a bunch of paper. I guess I left it on the desk. Oh well, we, we can survive. So anyway, here's here's the deal. Let me go to let me go to the good old doc cam here and write down some of the definitions that you'll need to know um, because some of this you just I've I've kind of given you the big idea. Now, it's just a matter of, oh, that's kind of cool, even without the lights. All right, but this works better. All right, now then, here's what you need to know. 
All right. Let's say in, in the book they had this little thing. They always use this. I don't care what science book you're using or anything like that. They always use kind of like they got a little photon here that's going to go bing, 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 back and forth. All right. Got a photon clock. All right. And basically what that means is for every up, for every oscillation on that photon clock, that's one second or something like that. Okay. So if I'm standing right here, and that clock is going ding, 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 ding. In other words, it's right next to me. The clock that is right next to me that does not is not moving. Clock not moving is called the proper time. Proper time, and we call that delta T O. Okay? Proper time, clock not moving. Now, the reason why, if somebody is speeding by at close to the speed of light, as they're going, as they're cruising along, at one point their clock is right here. Okay, so they got this little clock right here, and their photons down here. Then as they're going by me, it's like this. And then their photon is right here. And then as they finally get, that's when they're right in front of me. And then when they finally get past me, that photon is right here. So it has gone through. Now, the speed of light cannot change. All right? The speed of light cannot change. It is constant. It is constant at 186,000 miles an hour or 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. One or the other. But what happened to this clock, though? What happened to the time? According to the observer on the Earth, as this thing's going by, it slowed way, way down. Slowed way down. All right? Because they're in a different inertial reference frame. All right? But their velocity is the same. Okay? Their velocity is the same. So, so their clock slowed way down. So in moving objects, the, the, you've got time dilation. And that's delta T. That's for things that are moving. Time dilation is delta T. All right? Now then, the book, the book did something that I hadn't seen before, and it said to make an accurate measurement of something that's moving, you better mark the end simultaneously. Okay? A better way to say that, I think, is if I want to get an accurate move, measurement of something, pick something that's not moving in your reference frame and then measure it. Okay. Otherwise, if I start to measure something that's moving, wait a minute, come back, get, get back, you get, uh, come here. All right. And I'll never, and I won't be able to do it. All right. So, okay. So, because we have time dilation, all right. Since this thing is moving by really slow, it it also, but um, but on board the ship, I've got the proper time, so it's moving right along, but then the length contracts, okay? So then we've got L, which is length contraction. Got L, which is length contraction. All right. Okay. Okay. So, and that is, an LO is proper length, proper length, and that is the length that's taken when something is not moving. All right. So I didn't, I didn't really look at the slides. I don't know what they look like, but let's go to one of your homework problems, okay? And this is homework problem number 20. This is homework problem number 20. Now, I didn't write, uh, well, I don't know which one it is. But here's what the solution of it looks like. There you go. All right, did you get that? Good. Now, what's that? Yeah, well, no, you're going you're gonna to follow along. Otherwise, that doesn't do you any good. Okay? Speaking of which... 
I have never heard of Cramster. What is Cramster? What? Uh, uh oh. All of a sudden, I, I just saw all these colons contract. But anyway, um, nothing. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? Uh, I, I've. It's a student resource website that has mastering physics all over it. I, I from what I hear. All right. Okay. Just little. You know. You got to remember. I taught bangers for years, so I know all the tricks. You know, I've been around. So anyway. Uh, anyway. All right. Let's move on. Okay. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna Google just see what it looks like. I mean, if it's out there, it's out there. There's nothing you can do about it. All right, um, I just never heard of it before. Okay. Oh, well, anyway. Oh, you need the equations first of all to get time dilation. That equals delta t naught, the the actual the time that's not moving, divided by one minus v squared over c squared, and your book defines this gamma. I've seen other books do the gamma um, too, and it's it's okay. It, it just it because that shows up this little relativistic term, this little relativistic constant shows up all the time. And then length contraction looks like this. Length contraction because we're contracting looks like is that is that okay because. This thing will give you a number less than one. All right, this thing will give you a number less than one. And there's a nice little Pythagorean proof of why that works based on the photons flying. Yes, Richard. You're right. There, I fixed it. In other words, gamma is equal to this. I'm not used to using gamma. It's one over one minus the square root of 1 over v squared over c squared. Good. Thanks. All right. So delta t could equal this, would equal um, delta t naught times gamma. And L is equal to L naught divided by gamma. Whereas gamma is less than 1. All right. They just, hey, saves textbook costs, basically. That's, what, that's all they're doing. You know, to keep from doing that and that. They're trying to save textbook costs. All right, which for like a modern physics book or something like that, it, it, it adds up really quick. All right, now, your problem reads like this. I'm just going to read it to you. It's story time. It says serious. Okay, we got a serious problem. Ha! <laughs> Sorry, little astronomical joke there. Okay, got a serious problem. Is about nine light years from Earth. To reach the star by spaceship is in 12 years, takes um, 12 years in the ship time, okay, in the spaceship time. The spaceship is sitting there looking at its little photon clock going ding, 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 ding. Is this time, is this dilated time or is this proper time? That's proper time. There you go. Okay, so for this problem. What's that? Delta T Y, delta T naught is going to equal 12 light years. So you're going to have to get used to some funky, funky uh, equations here. All right. So delta T naught is equal to 12 light years. Now the distance, the distance measured from Earth, the distance measured from Earth is. Um, Oh, duh, I'm getting all screwed up. Light years is a distance. It's 12 years, and the distance measured from Earth, L, is equal to, um, what does it say? Nine light years. Nine light years. Okay. By the way, what's a light year? It's not the offspring of Buzz either. What's the, what's the light year? It's right. The, the 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 distance from Earth because we're doing it relative to Earth. It's the distance from Earth of um, how far 
how many meters that would be at going 3.8 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second in 365 days that's how far you'd go in one light year that's what we mean by a light year so it's a long way away because how long does it take for light to the sun to reach us exactly eight minutes the geoscience they know this stuff all right so it's eight minutes all right and so and how many miles is the sun away yeah 90 not 92 93 <laughs> what's well, a million miles when you've gotten that far right about 92 to 93 million miles away okay and it only takes light eight minutes to cover that distance so if you're thinking nine light years oh my gosh that's a long ways away that is a long long ways away all right so anyway all right so how fast to reach the star by spaceship in 12 years uh, okay so it's nine light years from Earth okay so now we've got to figure out how fast do you need to be going in other words relative to C how fast do you need to be going to reach that um, must you travel in other words we want to get there in 12 we want to get there in proper time is 12 years and we've got L is equal to um, now as a smart aleck and I've lost my here it is lost my notes all right okay so measured from earth here's what we've got we've got nine light years so I'm gonna go nine years times C that's a light year okay so the length divided by V that give me my velocity okay that's my velocity there you go because if it's nine light years away if this is my length length divided by V is going to give me my time correct All right right should okay so I wind up with this with the proper time which is 12 years one of the nice things about working in relativity we don't have to convert that to seconds so we've got 12 years over 1 minus V squared over C squared what's that yeah yeah the C is equal to the speed of light 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second okay now oh my but we usually don't write that out so now what do we got ugly algebra I mean just ugly you ugly anyway but we can do this we can do it first of all the nice thing is the years cancel think think get the year units to cancel anything else can't all right when you're stuck with something like this what do you need to do what's the first thing if you're if you're stuck with something like this that well there's the first thing I might do is flip it over because I'm trying to find V okay I might flip it I might take the inverse right away then what's the second thing I do square both sides there you go square both sides and when you do that all right so that's the way you go about that and it looks like this for some now wherever I have 20 this was when I was doing my homework all right and it just got ugly like I said it just gets ugly but you can do it you can do it it, it just becomes like a uh, I mean you just wind up here you go let's do a little bit of it boink boink and then um, so that can't so that's good oh we can even take this one down to 3 C over V equals 4 Y over 1 minus V okay I've divided both sides by 3 and I canceled the Y oh yeah so why did I put him back in because he's pesky all right now square both sides again now not again but now let's flip it over this is a legal move I can do this you can do these things when you're king there we go flip him over and we get 4v over 3c equals 1 minus v squared over c squared now square both sides 
and you get 16 v squared over 9 c squared equals 1 minus v squared over c squared. Oh my! What's something else we can do? We can do this. We can get v squared over c squared plus 16 v squared over 9 c squared equals 1. Whew! Now, can I take the square root of both sides and get v over c plus 4 over 3 equals 1? Nah, don't do that. Can't do that. It's illegal. You can multiply both sides by 9 here. Oh my. This just keeps going on and on forever. All right. So here we go. Uh, no. Actually, you get a question on the test like 16, which is much easier. I didn't know this one was going to be so hard. I was hoping it would be like 16, which is real straightforward, which we'll do on Monday. All right. So by the time you get through all that, I mean, the rest is just, the rest is just algebra. All of what was up to this point was just algebra. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at something might be more helpful. Let's take a look at what problem 16. No, let's not. Let's go ahead and look at something else. Here, hold on. That might be even more interesting than doing problems, I think. Yes, yes. Oh, really? All right, Reed just said, hey, cross multiply the thing and then solve it out. I was getting there. I was getting ready to multi cross multiply after about 12 steps. But other than that, I was all over it. Okay, so here we go. Let's take a look at this slideshow from the beginning. Now, special relativity clip. This is going to be real exciting. This is going to be like a physics colloquium. All right? But this is kind of cool. Hopefully this works. We'll see if this works. Hey, it's going to work. Okay, seven minutes. This frame of reference, Jabber on the shore is standing still, while his twin boat is moving away from shore at five miles per hour. Jabber on the boat also thinks of himself as standing still, while the shore and his twin on the shore move away at five miles per hour. As long as the boat's going at constant the velocity, can't accelerate. The same way. The motion of juggling is the same for the twin standing on the shore as it is for the twin moving with the boat. And that's the first postulate of relativity, that the laws of physics are the same in all uniformly moving frames of reference. Now Einstein threw light into the equation. He was convinced that no matter how fast each juggler was moving relative to the other, each one would still measure the speed of light passing by him to be 186,000 miles per second. But how could that be, given their different frames of reference? Simply put, Speed is the measure of distance traveled in a unit of time. If the speed of light is constant, Einstein thought, something else must change. In a flash of brilliance, Einstein asked, what if the speed of light doesn't change, but time does? It was a radical thought, and one that was very difficult to accept, even for Einstein. How could it be that time runs differently for someone moving than for someone standing still? Einstein set out to prove that this could be true. Can we all agree, he asked, that two events are simultaneous? They occur at precisely the same time for one of us. Do they have to occur at precisely the same time for all of us? His answer, no. <coughs> to prove it, Einstein conducted a thought experiment. He imagined placing two poles alongside the Okay, if you get this, explain it to me later. I don't get it, but Using see if you can.
same distance, same speed. But how are the same events perceived by the observer moving with the train? He also has a right angle mirror. The lightning strikes just as it did before. But during the time it takes the light to reach the observer, his frame of reference moves closer to the forward pole. This observer sees the lightning strike the pole that is moving toward first as the beam of light coming from that pole. As a shorter distance to travel, the beam of light coming from the pole is moving away from it. Oh! I get it! Okay. You just have to watch it four times. As hard as it is to believe, if you were able to discern the difference, you would find that time actually passes more slowly on the drive to school than it does while sitting at your desk. And at greater speeds, say at 90% of the speed of light, the results would be truly remarkable. Time would slow down, and you would shrink to 40% of your usual length from the point of view of that person watching from the side. And here at last was the answer to the question Einstein asked 10 years earlier. What would happen if you could ride a beam of light? Nothing. It could never happen. <laughs> because at the speed of light, length shrinks to zero and time stands still. Which at the first glance seems absolutely crazy. If you, you have mass, <laughs> which we'll get to later. And yet when you look at it, it is totally and beautifully consistent. And it works, and that was it. That was the discovery of the special theory of relativity. Later that same year, Einstein applied special relativity to mass and energy and found that E equals MC squared. Drill do Monday. Which means that the energy contained in any object is equal to the mass times the speed of light squared, an enormous number. And if mass contains energy, then energy has mass. Every second, the Earth is struck by four and a half pounds of sunlight. Who could have thought that a 26-year-old patent clerk who worked on physics in his spare time would change forever our understanding of the universe? Okay. Yeah, we got another one. We got another one. All right. Um, I, I'll save general relativity for, for next time. Okay. All right. So we do have to talk about time travel. This one's a little, this one's a little bit shorter. And this is by... This guy writes some really good books that are accessible. River of time may port with the two rivers 
and the river of time may perhaps be bent like a pretzel. Now, Einstein, of course, had doubts about time travel, but his office mate, Kurt Gödel, perhaps one of the greatest mathematical additions of the last thousand years, was the first one in 1949 to find a solution of Einstein's equation which allowed time travel. If the universe rotates and you were to go around the universe, you would come back before you left. Einstein, of course, was puzzled that a rotating universe would allow for time travel, but he said in his memoir that he's not worried because the universe does not rotate. The universe expands. Well, since then, we've now discovered literally hundreds of other types of solutions of Einstein's equations which allow for time travel. If you have an infinite cylinder and the cylinder rotates, and you dance around the cylinder like dancing around the maypole, you can also come back before you left and meet your parents before you're born. Another way is to have a wormhole. Take a sheet of paper, draw two dots on it, fold the sheet of paper until the two dots meet, and that's a wormhole. Alice in Wonderland had a wormhole. The looking glass of Alice is a shortcut between two points in space and time. Now there's a catch. Using Einstein's equations, you can show that the energy necessary to bend space and time into a pretzel is comparable to an exploding star, a black hole. Energy far beyond anything we can harness on the planet Earth. So maybe in outer space, maybe aliens have harnessed time machines, or maybe your descendants, thousands of years into the future, may have mastered the art of time travel and have harnessed the energy of a star. So one day, if somebody knocks on your door and claims to be your great, 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 great granddaughter, thousand years into the future, don't slam the door. Because maybe your descendant got into a time machine to visit her illustrious ancestor. Okay, so with that thought, now one last thing. Oh, whoops. Okay, so how much energy was needed? Okay, that movie came out before you all were born. But anyway, um, and, and back then, they didn't talk about it because I heard someone say, no, nah, it's a gigawatt. Right. Uh, back then, when this, this movie was made six years, in 84, 85, something like that, it was made uh, before um, I bought my first, well, eight years before I bought my first 386 computer, which had 85 megabytes of of uh, memory to it and so megabytes gigawatts all that kind of stuff um they would but now you guys go oh yeah you know i've got eight gig in this thing right here you know which is unheard of which would have been unheard of just well not 20 years ago because 20 years ago the guys who won the nobel prize in physics um they won it in 2006 they got it for coming up with the storage facility, the, the magnetic storage, which we learned about. Remember, a magnetic field can hold energy. And so that's the storage that they, that they came up with, with different materials. And so they can store gigawatts of things. So we didn't know about, I mean, it just wasn't something that was used. I mean, megawatt was as big as we got. So, so I think that was where the uh, producers of the movie kind of messed up but anyway so we'll talk so we've you've been introduced a little bit to uh time dilation which means time's expanding we'll look at general relativity next time um and i'll tell you what we'll do some of your problems too and i'll tell you what kind of relativity there's two relativity problems i love to do that will be on your exam and i'll just tell you what they are so you can practice them all right what's that